What's up to all my product founders and creatives out there? This is your host, Lisa Montero, and you're listening to the Visual Commerce Podcast, where founders, creatives, and brand leaders bring you insights on how to tell better visual stories of your product in three, two, one. We are here with Brandon Bayer, creative director of Good Ground. Brandon has over 13 years of experience in the creative world, and I'm especially excited because today Brandon is going to help give us perspective on some of the most common terms we hear today around visual storytelling. Brandon, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me, Lisa. I'm excited to talk with you today. So you have been in the creative fields for a while now. Could you start by giving us some background on your journey as a creative director and where you're at right now? Great. Yeah. So I think I'll start by, you know, it's, it's often a cliched story, but uh, often cliches are quite true. Uh, I was a creative kid, um, enjoyed drawing, painting, taking things apart, putting them together poorly. Um, and eventually, you know, made my way to, to college, hopped around, changed my major many, many times more than I'd like to admit, ended up at a, at a really great art school in Detroit called CCS college for creative studies. Um, I studied graphic design and it was really, really great comprehensive, um, education from a creative standpoint. Um, so, you know, after that, I, I worked a little bit in Detroit and I made my way to New York, which were sort of this big turning point in my life where everything really changed. Um, met some of the most creative, incredible people that, uh, that I've ever met, uh, really inspirational. Uh, worked at a lot of different agencies, or not a lot, but several, Code and Theory, Tribal, DDB. And then I guess my last agency I worked at was Wondersauce, and I worked there for 18 years, or 18, uh, eight years. Um, but I've worked sort of in the creative field for about 13 years, working on a lot of different brands, such as like Brooks Running, Condé Nast, The Sill, Oliva, the NFL, Snapple, Dr. Pepper, to name a few, sort of a varied bunch there. Um, but yeah, I think my, my overall, my creative journey, uh, was really shaped by my upbringing and my many, many jobs that I had as a youngster. Um, I just have a very varied, um, interest, um, and people always are surprised to hear that I had so many different little jobs. I worked as a cook. I worked at a jewelry store. I worked at, um, I painted dumpsters. Like there was a lot of different things that I did, and I think they all really shaped the way um, I conduct myself in business. Um, so yeah, um, in the last uh, in the last year, uh, I've started my own. I'm calling it like a creative studio and consultancy called Good Ground. Um, and I'm working with closely with some founders and CEOs and really stakeholders to find areas of opportunity. Um, really been focusing on upfront branding and positioning of companies, um, trying to get them started on what I like to consider solid ground or better yet, like good ground. Um, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing. And I have some other projects that I'm, I'm working with, working on now, but, um, a lot of different, um, different aspects to the creative journey in what I've worked on. I've worked on, uh, primarily a lot of digital work. Um, and digital advertising, a lot of websites, a lot of content creation, um, and working at Wondersauce for for about eight years really helped them um, level up from a, only a few people to 100 and about 120 people over five different offices. So it's been a it's been a really good journey. And now I'm in Los Angeles. I live in Los Angeles now. I can imagine you've certainly run the creative gamut. And now we're in the age where visual storytelling is crucial for the survival of a brand. There's a lot of people trying to adjust to this heightened need, but might still be having difficulty just understanding what this all really means. Could you help our listeners understand what does visual storytelling mean for a brand and how have you potentially seen growth or shift in this definition throughout your years as a creative director? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think simply, simply put is, you know, visual st- storytelling is a way for customers or users to learn about a product service or concept and it's base level. Um, I think the big shift in the last handful of years is, you know, many, uh, many clients talking 
about storytelling um, and really focusing on the telling part and not so much the story. Um, and I think that that's something that I've really been focusing on my current work is really trying to identify what the story is they're trying to tell. That is, that's sort of, I'm sort of really interested in right now is like your mission, your vision, like what is the, what are the values you have as a company? Cause I think those things are the things that come out in the content that you should be creating. Um, the, the aspect of a visual storytelling that I think people often get caught up on is the, the actual, the end product, seeing the thing and saying, look at that. Like, I want that. I want it to look like this at company X. Um, and sometimes company X is maybe a unique or a front runner. Um, there's, there's many different brands out there that everyone's just trying to mimic, but they really have a strong stance in the market. You know, that could be Glossier or it could be, uh, Warby Parker, any of these companies, but what they're doing is they're not so much looking outward, they're looking inward. And I like to often say that to any of my, my clients is stop looking at everything else, you know, look inward and try to define some of the things that is important to you as a business or as a uh, proprietor owner or whatever you are, or a brand manager, try to figure out what you want. And then then go to the more tactical stuff, go into the content. What do you want to produce? Um, Cause I think sometimes uh, inspiration is great, but it, it often gets in the way of, uh, um, of the true story. And you might be trying to just mimic everyone else's story. Absolutely. And could you discuss a specific project you worked on where the visual storytelling heightened the brand significantly? Yeah. So there's a variety of different projects. I think one specifically, I worked with the Sill uh, plant, um, so e-commerce plant business um, that has really gained a lot of traction in in the number in the last few years. Um, we we worked closely with a, another uh, person, Jeanette Abink, and she was a creative director, sort of a consultant on their side. And she was working on some of the branding and we were really responsible more to the digital aspects of things. And she was really involved with more of the store and the physical aspects. But um, we we worked on the design and the uh, content for, for the sale. And um, previous to that, some of the we really got a good understanding from, from the founder is that there is hurdles, a lot of hurdles to buying plants online. You know, um, you're going to buy something that is truly unique. Every plant is different, just like us, right? Um, and and customers would be would complain. Customers would say, "Hey, my plant doesn't look like the plant in the photo." And that was a that was something that was put forward to saying like we have to figure out a way to solve that problem. So I think something that maybe is often overlooked is the more information a designer an art director or anybody from the creative team has, they can really gear that content towards the end user or whether it's a customer or what have you. So we're saying, what are, what are ways we can like achieve that um, through maybe close up, maybe close up, maybe we, we really do dramatic, a dramatic photo shoot. We really get close to the, to the plants and we romanticize them and really um, try to make them more interesting. I mean, plants are really beautiful and great specimens. And so we just, excuse me, we just discussed a lot of different ways to just maybe we crop into things. Maybe we use hands. Maybe we, we, we just try to make these things not so finished product. Oh my God, it's going to, it needs to look exactly like that when I get that. It's more of a, a visual storytelling. It's not so one and done, like that is exactly what I'm going to get. So we shot a lot of different photos, like I was saying, close-ups of, of, the, of the plants um, and really trying to use hands um, also as, as, a, as our own props to maybe detract and make things a little more lighthearted um, and try to appeal to a certain, certain demographic as well. So that's, I think, uh, an area where we've sort of brought uh, we leveled that company up i think from a from a content standpoint which is really amazing they still adhere to the guidelines that we put in place we worked with a really great still photographer to to execute a lot of that and it all is 
still, the wheels are still on and everything seems to be really going well for them. They actually, they have a, a store that's quite close to my my apartment right now uh, here in, here in Los Angeles. And at the time they only had one store. So uh, props to them. They, uh, they're a really great, passionate bunch. Um, and we had definitely learned a lot from them working with them. That's awesome. I, I love that case study. I'm a personal fan of the sale. So that, that makes me excited. So from your perspective, how would you define the term strategic creative and how does this affect how you approach your clients? I think, uh, again, with, I think there's a lot of buzzwords that get thrown around here. And I think, you know, we use the word strategic and it sometimes is almost like just by using the word strategic, it's like implied that we're being strategic. Um, so I always sort of laugh at it. It's like, well, let's back up a little bit. What is the action? What is the strategy? Um, so I see like strategic creative as being anything that has a clear, goal in mind and how that creative is going to be used. Um, you know, I think all this ladder, a lot of these things are interconnected and woven together, but, you know, knowing what something's going to be used for is really important to the creation itself. You know, I think I could sort of harken back to a, another example here. Um, Wonder, when I was working at Wondersauce, we worked with Bombas, a uh, sock company, direct to consumer sock company. That's widely, widely known now. Um, they, we worked on the design of their site and one of their big pushes was bundling. And we were in charge of doing the, doing a lot of the content, like on foot content and sort of flat lays of content. I didn't work directly on the project. I just consulted internally with our creative studio and some of our art directors on sort of what was the strategic plan for for all these layouts, you know, the the, the founders wanted to make sure that they could do bundles sort of at a, at a moment's notice. So we developed all these different flat lays, isolated PNGs, shot them all individually, and then a really talented art director, probably, I don't know if he's an art director anymore. He, he developed a sort of a, a Photoshop plugin that then would sort of layer all the, the images on top of each other um, with a few clicks so they could do this really easily. So I found that that was a super efficient way to get the client, solve the client's problem and also be efficient with their time, money, energy, effort, et cetera. Um, so I think that it was a really good example of being strategic. And another thing about sell was they sell a lot of different pots. They want to make sure that the, everyone is seeing all the different pots that the plants could go in. So you could basically buy by a, um, uh, I don't, can't even think of the name of a plant now. Um, but you could buy a plant and put it in any different pot you want. Um, and one of our suggestions was instead of shooting all those different pots, we would just retouch them in post to again save them money and time. So those, there's little I think, creative workarounds that maybe aren't considered um, by clients. And as long as we know some of those constraints and what things are going to be used for, we can better better engineer or, or create content to serve those needs. Absolutely. Both the Sill Bombas are great, great examples. Now, the term elevated is thrown around a lot. How do you define the term visual elevation and what might be the metric to even decide if something is elevated? Yeah, I think this is this is one that I think that has the most ambiguity around it because uh, I think it comes down to it's really a subjective thing. And what I how I see it is is it's sort of this uh, giving something a look that gives the customer the impression that the perceived value of the product is higher than the asking price. I think there was a lot of a lot of words there, but making something look expensive, you know, um, making say this doesn't look like a $10, you know, item, whatever it is, bag or whatever the item is. So that is, I think the big thing. And it also letters back to really like taste and what, what, what a client and a customer or a potential, 
uh, who, who's, who's going to consume this item, what their interests are. So we always say, hey, we're trying to make this brand more elevated. And I think at its core, what I just said is like, it looks like I'm getting a deal if I'm buying this. I'm buying this for $50 and this feels like a $200 item. Like this, this just seems too good. I'm already in. This is all, this is aligning with my values. This is aligning with my, my tastes and it's a, it's a no brainer. So I sort of see that as one aspect of this, this term elevated, but I think how you achieve it, how you really do achieve something elevated is I, what I like to call consideration and it's really about planning. So every element of a photo or a piece of content or video, what have you, is is considered and is an intentional. The background, lighting, foreground, cropping, hands, no hands, props, people. What is it? Like knowing everything that you want in there will give this something that feels very, very intentional and considered. So I see that is another aspect of this. Um, this term elevated, but uh, I think when people often say it, they just mean I want it to look expensive, um, which isn't bad. I'm glad to have some clarification around that term because we are seeing it a lot. And I think people just get lost in, in in the word and don't really have a definition around it. And I know us in the studio have gotten that a lot. What does elevated really mean? So thank you for clarifying that term for us. Now, this podcast exists to help people tell better visual stories of their product to be successful in visual commerce. What does visual commerce mean to you? And what is your advice for not just how to survive in it, but how to really thrive in it? Yeah, um, I think the vi visual commerce is, is really this, this idea that customer expectations are growing and growing. You know, if somebody's going to, if we're talking about e-commerce and somebody's going to purchase something online, we need to create an environment in a situation that is better than seeing something in person. And that's maybe the advantage we have. We can do 360 videos. We can, we can sh get really close to things. We can put it in situations. We can use AR and all these different, you know, tools to put it in our homes and put it in our spaces. So I think there's, there's so many different avenues we can, you know, we can go down and ultimately they're sometimes really distracting um, from the point of like what we're trying to do. So there's a lot of different things that can uh, detract from what we're doing, but at its base, it's really important for my clients to show their product in, in the best lighting in the best way possible. Um, one of my current clients has, they make one of a kind items and we've been investigating different mechanisms to shoot more images. So now they only have four images and I'm, I, we're saying, Hey, we should have at least eight images of each pro each individual product. So that in itself is telling, telling more story about this, just this product. If it's a one of a kind item. I need to see the full thing. I, I, if I'm going to buy this thing, I want to know exactly what every angle and every little nook and cranny is about this product. So just on its base level of just the product, we can tell a little bit of a story, more of a story there. Um, and I think how to thrive is, I think, quite, quite a challenging question. Um, but I would say oftentimes... Um, our CEO, when working at, at Wondersauce, he would always say, "Pick one thing, pick one thing, and do it well." And I, and I still, I still use that, and I always give him credit, um, credit John Samponi for saying that. And I, and I adhere to it. It's you know, you don't want to do everything, but if pick your spot and do it well. If you're going to try to produce con all this different type of content, and you want to do all these different things. Like try, try one thing, plan it well execute, put it into the world and then iterate and just see, see how it does take some learnings and then go from there. That's, um, that's my, <laughs> that's my simple advice. I'm oversimplifying it. I love it though. Those are some awesome words of advice, Brandon. Before I close out, what are you currently up to in the creative world that we can look forward to seeing in the coming months? 
Well, um, uh, a number of things. So I think one of the things I've um, I've been helping produce a, a book for a couple clients of mine, Billy Clark and Clayton Abgar. They are uh, executive headhunters that run a company called BCCM, and they're sharing their insights and frameworks on how to find a, a really great job and how to sort of maybe pivot your professional self. And the, the book's called The Little Book to Land Your Dream Job. They really believe that everyone deserves the opportunity to be their best professional self. The book will be available June 15th on Amazon in whatever preferred format you you like, uh, physical, ebook, audiobook. Um, we just recorded that audiobook last week, which it's really exciting. That's one thing. And I've been working with this company, Rareform, I may have mentioned, which is a direct consumer brand that repurposes billboard vinyl and makes them into one of a kind bags, um, working them on defining their brand positioning and producing more of a comprehensive brand guide. And I'd say like a little reshaping of their brand a little bit um, or a little reforming uh, of their brand. So those are a couple exciting things that I've been working on and um, that I can share. And yeah. I'm super excited to see those come forth. Brandon, thank you so much for joining us today. It's awesome to hear these crucial terms clarified and defined by someone who has the heightened experience in visual storytelling. For those of you listening, head over to good-ground.com to get in touch with Brandon and team. Thank you for tuning in to the Visual Commerce Podcast.